Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the second session of Beth Lita's new series on the Nevi'im, on the prophets. Uh, last session, we spoke about two models of what the prophet occupied, or the prophet, um, how the prophet existed. One model was that of um, the messenger of God's word, right? That the prophet was seized by the power of God's revelation, consumed by it, and then became the agent of God's, of God's message for the people. And that image, that vision, that model seems like especially passive because in a sense like God like programs in the word and then it comes spouting out of the prophet's mouth. But then we started to see some moments of resistance showing how um, the prophet was never just a passive microphone or a megaphone, but rather the prophet was always a person. The prophet could have a challenge in what it means to take on this immensely difficult journey this task, um, and also we see the resistance that the prophet's about to face from the people. Eventually, we saw a second model of the prophet, which we, it was kind of like the intensification of that resistance, in which the prophet actually stands in the way of God, serving Kivyachal as God's conscience, not just as God's collaborator. Um, so, what we were left with, though, was, you know, that was, this was based on the work of Yochanan Mufs, wonderful Bible professor, blessed memory. But I added a, co a, a codicil to that, to that image of the dialectic between the collaborator and the conscience, the, the megaphone and the resistor, to, um, to actually see that really the point of the prophet is, is unified in that the prophet occupies the conjunction, right, the meeting point between God and the people. That's the space that, that the prophet occupies. That the prophet either is bringing God to the people or helping to bring God's word to the people or bringing the case of the people to God. The prophet is that space in which the God, the human divine encounter occurs. And it's modeled by the prophet, but not entirely monopolized by the prophet, as we're going to see today. So today's session is going to continue with a more general introduction to the prophets or to prophecy as a phenomenon before we move in the next three weeks to a more focused study on the three Haftorahs of, of, of rebuke that take place between Shiva Sarvatamus and Tisha B'Av. We'll be in what's called Inyana de Yoma, you know, um, in, the, in the rhythm of the Jewish calendar. Um, but today, you know, as we, con as we continue to build up our familiarity with the prophets and with prophecy, um, today is, we're going to be drawing on the work of Abraham Joshua Heschel, blessed memory, um, who wrote his doctoral dissertation in uh, Germany called Die Prophetie, the Prophets, which he then expanded uh, later in his career, about 10 years before he died in 1962, um, to a longer work in English uh, called The Prophets. So um, it is a uh, phenomenological study of the prophets. Now that is a fancy $5 word, meaning that it is a, an attempt to try to study the consciousness of the prophet, the experience that the prophet is having. The point, says Heschel, is not just to pay attention to the message that the prophet is saying, but is trying to understand what is unique and compelling and commanding about what the prophetic experience has to show us. What does it mean, not just to, uh, to read the prophets, but what does it mean to imagine yourself as a prophet, right? That the prophet in communicating to us is not just communicating the content, but is also trying to communicate the, uh, the nature of that experience or what it feels like. And that itself actually is what we're going to be paying attention to in this class. We're gonna be looking at selections from the writings of the prophets but we're going to be trying to find something, in a sense, behind the words. What's motivating it? Such that we can then start to elicit a kind of theory, a kind of even theology of what Heschel calls divine pathos. Pathos is a Greek word which we're familiar with from the English uh, word sympathy or empathy or even pathetic. But pathetic is best understood in like the French sense of pathétique, right? Not that it's like someone's a, a loser or uh, a chump, but rather that pathetic means, or pathetic means you're like full of pity. You're full of uh, feeling. Sympathy means to feel, uh, uh, feel about somebody, and empathy means to feel with somebody. So here we have God as depicted against the philosophical image. So in a way, like this whole book is kind of like a shadow boxing with a, 
at least a, a version of how people read the Rambam as a, like a dry, technical, hyper-intellectual philosopher. Heschel actually interestingly wrote two books about the Rambam, but has a very much more, a different depiction of what the, of what Rambam entailed. But Maimonides in like this kind of character, char, uh, caricature version of it, right, uh, you know, is commonly is describing God drawing on Aristotle, right, the famous phrase, the most, the unmoved mover, that God is the first cause, the prima causa, right, that God, what is God? God, you know, th rolls the first, uh, cube uh, uh, pool ball and it hits the rest of the pool balls and it sets everything in motion but god god self is not impacted my right? god is sanctioned transcendent secure by contrast heschel uh elicits from the prophets a vision of god as the most moved mover god defined actually by god's depth and ill and Ill illimited caring god's feeling god's investment and being compelled by, commanded by, you know, we see the prophet is being compelled by, commanded by God's word. But in this like fascinating reversal, God is compelled by, commanded by, uh, moved by the state of human affairs. Um, there's an incredible uh, uh, contrast that we'll see soon. But first I want us to start by um, just starting by looking at actually a prophetic text. We're gonna dive in but then I want us to try again to look behind the text to see what we're going to see. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, writings from Amos or Amos, famous Amos. Um, if I remember correctly, 8th century BCE, northern prophet, so primarily prophet, prophet, prophesizing to the northern, northern kingdom of Israel um, prior to, of course, the Assyrian invasion in 722. <laughs> Um, Amos especially is famous, not for his cookies, but uh, for his uh, deeply impassioned calls for justice. Uh, if you want to find, you know, what we actually I think we'll look in a way later at God's passion for justice as it comes through in the prophetic writings or social justice. And uh, Amos is like your go-to guy for that especially. Uh, and we're going to see that, although that's not what we're going to focus on primarily. So let's let's start. Um, does anyone actually want to read? I'll do it. Uh, okay, so we'll start with Amos chapter six. Ah, you who are at ease in Sion and confident on the hill of Shomron of Samaria, you notables of the leading nation on whom the house of Israel pinned their hopes. So first of all. Right. I mean, when we think about, you know, like one thing I want to start doing in this class, especially, is that when we're studying the prophets, we really have to look at them as literature, because what is the prophet prophet on one hand? Right. We're looking at the prophet as a as a site of an intense religious experience. But on the other hand, right, the prophecy experience is not just something that the prophet feels and it goes away. The prophet is then called on to express, to describe to evoke and to communicate God's message to the people. So the prophet is on one hand, right, a mystic of sorts, right, com compelled by the experience of God. But on the other hand is a composer, right? The prophet is a poet. The prophet is using language to have an intended effect. So let's zoom back to high school literature classes. What's one of the classic questions we always have to ask? Who's the audience? Right, who to whom is Amos preaching, prophesizing? So, how would you describe just from this first verse, this first pasuk? Who are what's like just uh, be just general. You don't need to be specific. But who is he talking about, or who is he talking to? Okay, so Susie identifies the leaders. That there's some kind of it seems like a leadership class that he's directing his attention to. Those with power, right? Those with influence. Very good. Yes, I think that's quite right, right? The notables of the leading nation, right? So it's the nobles, it's the aristocracy, right? It's the people with, uh, with wealth and influence. Okay. Now, again, last week we started to see a hint towards the prophet not, you know, there is this notion of a court prophet, like a toady, 
a gopher for the royalty, right? The person who is an uh, emissary in a way, a, you know, is putting the stamp, God's gestamp, on everything that the king does. That prophet, in a way, his message is identical with that of the powerful, right? The prophet is a uh, PR guy. It's a PR flack. The mm -hmm. prophet as propagandist. But here we have a very different model of prophecy because the prophet is not advocating on behalf of the leaders, on behalf of the aristocracy. The prophet's concern is bringing up, well, I mean, what, so what's his, what's, what's his critique? Just from this first, like, tone, what's his tone? His tone is critical, but what's he starting to criticize the, uh, the landed elite for? He's criticizing them for um, just being taking it easy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, as you read further, it's worse, but just basically being like living off the fat of the land and not caring about anybody else. Okay. And yet you're the one that Israel, right? That, that mm -hmm. the Jewish people are hoping for. You're supposed to be the leaders. Good. So in a sense, he's suing, he's suing them for negligence. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's not. I mean, it's actually, as Heschel notes, right. The prophet is not a legalist, right. The prophet is not a halachist. So it's it's not that like he's bringing a suit against them, but the claim he's making against them, right. He's critiquing them, criticizing them, for their negligence, right. You are the people on whom Israel has pinned their hopes. With you know, you are in a position of responsibility, and yet you are kicking it and taking it easy. Right, you are forsaking your responsibility. In short, and I think this is the framing tone of this, this prophetic text, apathy. The sin of the leadership is apathy, right? You don't care. You're, I mean, look at, I mean, again, like look at the topography. Where is the, where is the leadership located? Where have they put themselves? Everything is like remember everything's metaphor. This is prophet. This is poetry. So where are they? Above the rest. Good. They're above. They're on the hill. They're on the mountain. Right. They're looking down and are like, oh, whatever. Right. They are removed. They're not down in the muck with the people. They're on the hill. Right. It's kind of like the um, they're in the heights exactly. They're indulgent, they're privileged, exactly. And, uh, you know, they're not using their, their power towards good end. But again, like everything, everything in poetry is, is towards a point. They are removed. They, it's, like the, it's like the cliche of the, of the aristocratic leadership in World War I, right? They're like up in their, in their um, what's the word I'm looking for? Their palanquin, right? Having high tea while the poor are fighting it out in the trenches, getting trench foot, dying of diphtheria, right? Whatever, right? They're up there, they're removed. Nothing's gonna happen to them. They're not personally implicated, okay? So let's see if we can, if we, Weiter, we continue. Yet, you gotta feel, that's, that's so powerful. Yet, you ward off the thought of a day of woe and convene a session of lawlessness, right? So it's, it's, Apathy, right, but apathy slides into what? It slides into a sense of, I mean, it's like you ward off the thought of a day of what? I find that, that Lushen so interesting. You, in a sense, actively refuse to think about the consequences. You don't care. You don't give it two thoughts, right? And you convene a session of lawlessness. Batigashon Sheves Hamas. Session is very nice because uh, actually session comes to the word to sit, and Sheves is also to sit. Um, Hamas also means like violence. It means um, it means lawlessness is nice, like anarchy, but not in like the hippy dippy way. Anarchy in the sense of like anarchy is loosed upon the land, um, right? So you. You know, to uh, to to Susie's point from the chat, quite right. They don't think of themselves as being uh, responsible. Rather, for them, that anything goes. You know, this is not maybe a world so different from our own, in which what does it mean to have power and influence? It means to be shielded from consequences. 
But here comes the twist, right? You'd think again, the person with God's ear, oh, well, I'm in a good, I'm in a good position in society. And thus, of course, since I'm doing, I'm riding high on the land, I'm riding high on the hog, on the imitation hog, of course it means that God approves. But we're going to see the twist. Right, but you see further images of this. We know they lie on ivory beds, lolling on their couches, feasting on lambs from the flock and on calves from the stalls. What is their life consist of? What does their life consist of? Appetite. Right, that's what they're concerned about feeding their gullets, pursuing their desires, right? Their concern is with, the ambit of their concern ends with themselves. Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, this is actually fascinating. They hum snatches of song to the tune of the lute. They just like walk around whistling <laughs> effectively, right? They just walk around whistling. They, and <laughs> I love it. They, th and they look at themselves as if they're rock stars. Right, they just like go around singing songs. And they're like, "Oh, I'm King David," right? Da David the harpist, David the psalmist. Uh, my little frivolities they accord with 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 uh, with with real significance. It's not right. It's not like oh, it's not like they're like using their power and influence to compose new music, right? They're not like patronizing a composer to help bring music to the people. No, they're just like walking around whistling without a care in the world and they're like oh look at my life right it's it's uh this you know it's it's astounding how amos uh, anticipated instagram <laughs> um they drink straight from the wine bowls and anoint themselves with the choicest oils right like again they are just indulging 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 but again to the point that so many of you are making in the chat indulgence comes with delinquency because when they are, their primary concern is with satisfying their selves, right, themselves. It's, it, it, by contrast, we see how clearly that their concern is not in any way, shape, or form motivated by, by the welfare of others. Okay? And, I mean, it's, and here, subtext becomes text. They are not concerned about the ruin of Joseph. And here, Amos is anticipating what's about to happen. All right, so I mean, again, Amos is prophesizing in the um, the preceding days before the Assyrian devastation of the northern kingdom, right, and the scattering of the ten tribes. Um, he's already calling it. He's already calling it the ruin of Joseph. Right now, we, if everyone's familiar, Ephraim slash Joseph is to the north as Yehuda is to the south. Right, the southern kingdom of Judah. Right, Judah, Yehuda. The northern kingdom is called Israel, but in terms of the like tribal mascot is associated with Ephraim slash Joseph. Okay? Uh, that shows up uh, that shows up interestingly actually when the northern kingdom spirals into idolatry, the statues they install in the northern um, sanction in the northern temple um, are the bulls. And bulls are associated with uh, Joseph. With Ephraim. So, um, they are not concerned. And here, I think, again, like that is a bolded line because, again, their sin is truly apathy. Dot, dot, dot. But my Lord God swears by himself, I loathe the pride of Jacob. I detest his fortresses. I will declare forfeit, i.e., I like a, I, 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 I swear you off. I'm done, right? City and inhabitants alike declares the Lord God of hosts. So, hey, it seems like this problem has metastasized uh, <laughs> beyond just the leadership. But B, right? I want to look at God's response. Okay, so what we have is. Amos criticizing the leadership of the people for being egotistical, self-concerned, lustful um, delinquents, right? Who are apathetic about the well-being of the society that they are putatively stewarding, mm -hmm. okay? And how does God respond? Let's make sure we get the content, right? The content is 
What does God say? Just make sure we get what God is saying here, as reported by Amos. I loathe the people, um, and I and I dislike everything. Well, the pride of Jacob. So I guess this means like the the leaders. Pride yeah. as opposed to just the regular people. Right. Although so it's the interesting. Kings, they were all really good friends. It's interesting in terms of what so God said. What yeah. God Yaakov's refers to. So you're saying the Go I, well, I think it means to. the leaders. The leadership. The pride being sarcastically because they're nothing to be proud of, mm -hmm. and and detest the fortresses. I just I detest the um, luxury in which you're living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how I read it. Is it yeah. the luxury, or is it that they've taken themselves out of the community? That they've separated themselves from like the regular man, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but can you uh, can you explain like because I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, oh you've yeah. changed the page. Um, but like Jacob and Joseph, like they're like the forefather, like they're like how can God hate someone that was like kind of revered? Is such an important ah. character in history. <laughs> so these are these are metonymies. So when it says when it says Yaakov or when it says Yosef or when it will say Ephraim near the end of the Shear, it doesn't literally refer to the historical persons. It's referring to the, the, them as like mascots. But really, it's like saying all hands on deck, right? It means you want the people, not the hands, right? So here, Jose, Joseph slash Jacob is referring to the Northern Kingdom. And, and you're right in saying like, it's kind of, it's a, it, I mean, what I want to be getting at, maybe and I think, I think this is what you're implying in a way, Susie, is that it's offensive, right? God responds with vitriol. Isn't that a bit surprising? Or like, you know, this, I mean, this is where like, we get a lot of uh, car caricaturistic depictions of like, the God of the Old Testament, right? God of wrath. What's amazing about Heschel's study of the prophets is in some way it's an, it's an apologetic, like it's a defense of the God of wrath. And in a way this class will be too. It, it, why, I mean, I want us again to look at the content and then also to try to figure out, we're gonna move towards what's motivating it. So God responds with hatred. I hate the pride of Jacob, right? Whether it's referring to the leadership class or it's referring to the arrogance that is typified by them, right? Their lofty, out of the world nature, their apathy, their negligence, their uh, egotistic, you know, their egotism. I detest the fortresses. And I think I saw actually in the, in the chat, very nice point. What is a fortress? It's something that keeps people out. Right, it's like you know, it's 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 the it's it's um, maybe it's like on one hand, it's the vanity building, right? It's like okay, you put all your money into a building development, into like a big tall tower. I don't know what kind of like leader, political leader, might just put all of his money into big tall ostentatious towers. That doesn't sound familiar to me at all. But uh, instead, right, we have what? But besides, like it being a vanity project, right? Of uh, pouring your money into something of ostentatious wealth. Also, a fortress is a piece of architectural technology that is designed to keep people out, right? And that maps to their removed, right? Their removed negligent natures. They're keeping out the masses. They're keeping out the rabble, the hoi polloi, okay? Um, okay, but God responds with hatred, with vitriol. And I want us to sit in that discomfort for a second. Okay, I want us just to take note of that. All right, here we're gonna have our first reading from uh, the late, the lamentably late Abram Joshua Heschel. Um, just quick biography, Abram Joshua Heschel, scion of the Apter Hasidic dynasty. Uh, he was not the first Abram Joshua Heschel, Avram Yeshua Heschel. You'll meet a lot of Avram Yeshua Heschels in Brooklyn right now, like alive, there are a ton of them. The uh, Oyev Yisrael, who was a 19th century Hasidic master, the lover of Israel, named after his book, was the first Avram Yeshua Heschel. He was the Opta Rebbe. 
the Rebbe of the Opt dynasty. Um, Heschel, our, our Heschel, grew up in Warsaw um, and was in line to be, uh, I don't know if he was like next in line, but he was in line to, to have a, a leadership position in the, in the, in the community. Um, he ended up going on a different path. He ended up going to the University of Warsaw? University of Berlin? He was in Berlin at some point. I probably he went to he ended up getting his PhD, um, and this and he wrote his dissertation on a phenomenological study of the prophets, but it was a reaction in some ways to the kind of universalistic philosophy. Right, that like the the Kantian philosophy, he um, in his in, in what instead he finds what brings him back in a sense to faith is that philosophy is concerned with categories, concepts, but the meaning of the individual life can't stand. The individual has no meaning in philosophy. In a way, the individual needs to be like dealt with. But the but the value, the, the, the compelling value of the prophetic experience, which is what draws him back, um, is that it is deeply, passionately concerned with human life. Um, Heschel is saved. Uh, by American philanthropic efforts as a refugee from uh, from Europe and is brought to Cincinnati where he is a professor at Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary there, and then eventually moves to New York where he was professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, um, which is a conservative seminary, where he was there at the same time as other luminaries like Shaul Lieberman, greatest Talmudist of the 20th century, and other, other greats. He himself, you know, had like a complicated relationship with the, as, as to Lieberman with the more, with the conservative world. Uh, Heschel is probably most famously known for his uh, friendship and, uh, and allegiance with, with Martin Luther King, um, having worked with him in matters of racial justice, in uh, opposing the Vietnam War. And he was really somebody who set a precedent for drawing on the model of the prophet as a voice of social conscience. Um, so to that point, he contrasts the prophetic experience, the, prof the, the meaning of prophecy with, um, with this philosophical tendency towards the general, right? Towards the categorical, towards in a way the inhuman. Um, he quotes, um, a number of like important philosophers who basically say, he quotes Plato's, uh, the laws which is a, um, he says, human affairs are hardly worth concerning in earnest, and yet we must be in earnest about them. A sad necessity constrains us. Right? Kikaro, the Roman Stoic, said, the gods attend to great matters. They neglect small ones. So that is the legacy. That's like the Greek legacy. It was very like common in especially mid 20th century writing to see like the contrast between Athens and Jerusalem, between Greek philosopher, Greek philosophy and the, in Hebrew faith. So here we have this contrast playing out. God cares about categories. God cares about klalim, right? The general. God doesn't care about the prot. God doesn't care about the specificities. God doesn't care about the particular, about the individual. But to Heschel, we have this powerful contrast. He says, to the prophet, however, no subject is as worth is as worthy of consideration as the plight of man. Indeed, and forgive all the like the masculine gendering. I'm just quoting in the light. Indeed, God Himself is described as reflecting over the plight of man rather than as con contemplating eternal ideas. That's fascinating. By the way, also a clear stutz to uh, to uh, to Rambam. Right? What does Rambam say? Again, drawing on Aristotle. God is thought thinking itself. God is the thought, the thinking, and the thinker, all wrapped up in one. That's what God is. God is a mind contemplating, like a meta-mind, a mind contemplating mind, a thinking contemplating thought. Okay? But Heschel says, no. Where in the Torah 
do we ever see God is described as removed? Thinking about stuff. No. God is described rather as preoccupied with man, with the concrete actualities of history, rather than with the timeless issues of thought. Heschel's saying, look at the Pshat. Look at the Tanakh. God is constantly on people's cases. God isn't like, stop bothering me. God is like, I'm going to bother you. Start bothering yourselves. In the prophet's message, nothing that has bearing upon good and evil is small and trite in the eyes of God. Man is rebellious and full of iniquity. See that in Parsha all the time. And yet, here's the, here's the turn, here's the twist. So cherished is he that God, the creator of heaven and earth, is saddened when forsaken by him. That starts to chip away at the wall. Profound and intimate is God's love for man, and yet harsh and dreadful can be his wrath. I loathe the pride of Jacob. Of what paltry worth is human might, yet human compassion is divinely precious. Ugly though the behavior of man is, yet may man's return to God make of his way a highway of God. Um, literally, we will see that verse quoted later. Solo, solo, derech Hashem. Pave the highway of God. Um, now can we reframe why it is that God responded with such passion? We have in that, in this verse from Amos, from Amos, a contrast. The contrast is between those with human might and the one with divine might. Those with human might indulge it. They, in, they magnify their wealth. They invest their money. They are concerned about getting more rich. Lahavdil, I'm not saying she is like this. Mackenzie Scott, was featured in an article recently, the uh, yeah. uh, Jeff Bezos' ex, was featured yeah. in an article as being the most generous philanthropist, I think female philanthropist, maybe in like history, right? She's like giving away billions and billions of dollars. Shkoyach, good for her. It's also the case that she's increased her wealth during the pandemic by $60 billion. She's given away a, like a tiny fraction of what she made by doing Nothing. Now, I'm not saying she's doing anything bad or wrong. This isn't like, Mackenzie Scott, I'm coming for you. But the nature of human wealth is that it accretes. Yeah. Whereas God's power, we're going to see the paradox of what it means for God, to, God, the divine model of power. They don't care. They're concerned with themselves. God swears on God's own name. God is putting God's reputation on the line. I loathe the pride of Jacob. Who is implicated? God is implicated. The people, uh, sorry, the, the, the pride of Jacob remove themselves, recuse themselves from involvement with their community. But God implicates God's self and responds with passion. Why is God responding with hatred? Because God is furious. God is so mad. God is so mad and betrayed that the sacred covenant is being broken, that God is being forsaken. So let's, let's continue with that theme. Okay. The righteous man, this is from Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah, Southern prophet, um, famous, most famous image, like, it seems like, knows the temple, famous image from Isaiah 6, we use in the Kedusha, Kadosh, 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 the Trishagion, the, the angel saying, holy, 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 sees a vision of, of the heavenly tabernacle. 
right? Ezekiel's famous vision is of the chariot, like the movable God. Isaiah's vision draws on the imagery from the temple. Okay, so the righteous man perishes, that Sadiq is gone, no one cares. Pious men are taken away, no one gives a thought that because of evil the righteous were taken away. So again, the prophet brings the claim of apathy. You look at your society, now, and it seems like here though, the, the claim, the, the critique seems to be general, it seems to be at the society writ large. You are not looking at your society in a way in which betrays your own responsibility for it. You are not looking and saying, wait a second, why are the good perishing? Why are people being thrown in jail? Right, it seems, they're being taken away. Where are they being taken to? Right, it seems like they're being kidnapped, being incarcerated, being removed as potential irritants. It's not an accident that it's Isaiah, famously in a lot of Midrashic legends, who like runs away. Isaiah flees the scene. There's even a Midrash that Isaiah actually hides it in a tree and then is killed by, uh, by one of the wicked kings. So, and here's an interesting language he ends up using. Almi tis agnagu. With whom are you enjoying yourself? Oneg. They use the word act familiarly. In other words, though, who are you sucking up to, right? Who are you, again, we have the claim of ease. Why are you focused on your, your benefit, your pleasure? At whom do you open your mouth and stick out your tongue? What a vibrant imagery, right? Why are you children of iniquity, offspring of treachery? Now we're getting into some, like, it's, it's kind of clear what he's saying, right? So, um, here we have claims of, like, terebinths or kind of tree, like the claim is that they're being idolatrous, da da da. I want to move on here, right? Here's what your problem is. You are pouring out your libations, you're giving sacrifices. Am I supposed to relent in the face of this, asks God? Fascinating critique, not just of their behavior, but on what specifically by saying that. We'll get to that point later, but I want you to think what God's saying, you're giving me, you're giving me these libations, you're giving me these carbonos, and you're expecting me to respond. Mm. Huh, look at this language that seems to have come back. On a high and lofty hill, you have set your couch. You are removed, you are lofty, you are distant from the concerns of the people. But here we actually have and what does it mean for you to go up on the hill? It's become what's called a bumma. It's become a, an idolatrous place of sacrifice. It's pl the place where you are offering, where you're giving korbanos it, inappropriately, right? So there's like uh, when Josiah sweeps through the land and re, you know, reforms it, remonotheizes it, um, one of these sweeps away all these, uh, all these bummos, all these stages, but it means these raised areas on which they were erecting an altar to have the to, to worship so isaiah is very very neatly connecting the people's recusal to their religious betrayal their place of apathetic indulgence is as if or is equal to or is happens to coincides with a place of religious uh forsake uh, forsaking Behind the door and doorpost, you have directed your thoughts, abandoning me. And here we have, it's not just that God is suing them through the mouth of Isaiah. What's, what's important about this clause right here? Yeah, Nancy. Well, um, they're performing the sacrifices. It's yes. corporate. Yes. Um, but it means something that um, they've raised themselves this high up. But uh, although they're performing it, uh -huh. the intention um, to um, 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 go and align themselves with God is not there. Um, it's like they're going through the performative stuff, but... Um, okay. Yeah. The outer motions are there, but the inner content is yeah, per is right, either yeah. empty, 
perverse, and manipulative, right? It seems like they're trying to like manipulate God, sweet talk God, give God a little payola, right? Yeah. Like here, take my goat, look the other way, right? Yeah, but it, I want, again, I want us to, I want us to pay attention to the literature the literary quality of this, the poets, the pro the prophets are poets. Okay. Josh, was it, isn't there any Josh also though, like during the time of Josh Sayer, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of this was like really mamish devoted Zora. I mean, they were, they had Asherat and they, yeah, they had the been, right. So, but the same thing with, um, so there was a Midrash that when Josh Sayer got rid of all the other, um, Bimont, he the people would hide in behind the door so that this was literal. The people hid behind the door, their Asherot. Yeah. So I think this could also be referring literally to behind the door and doorposts. Sure. But why? Because, is, because I think it's. Um, because it was so pervasive within society, I don't Fine, then would... say, then say Ashirot are proliferated throughout the land. They could, this is a more, uh, that it got to the point that you're bringing them in and hiding them, even though they're within your home, they're within all of you, right? Even though no, it's- except that, again, it's not, look, look at this. Behind the door and doorpost, you have directed your thoughts. Right. Okay, but so this... again, we need to attend to the language. So I want us to look okay. at, I want us to look at this. And I, again, like this is the kind of close reading that we're really gonna be practicing in this class. Third person, right? This is a general critique. Bad, you know, and again, it's not just idolatry. Idolatry is a moral collapse. It's not just a religious problem, right? Idolatry is bad, A, because it's other gods. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to that point in a second. But also idolatry comes along with immorality, mm -hmm. okay? The third, it starts in the third person. It's a general critique, right? We're in philosophy land. Injustice. God is saying you are not paying attention to the fact that people are being, it seems like, taken up off the street, that bad is being done to the good, okay? And then it's directed to the second person. With whom do you act so familiarly? So we move from the third person to the second person. We're getting more and more close. Da, 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 you, 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 they are your allotment to them. You have poured out libation for that should I. And then we have the first person in which God brings God's self into the equation. But it's God's self as subject. God has chosen to bring God's self into it, right? God is reflecting and saying, should I? It's rhetorical, obviously, not, right? God's uh, aghast. That's a subject. But now back to my original question. What's special about this clause here? God's sad. It, sorry? It, it's like God's sad. They're like mm -hmm. Definitely it, true. Or not. I mean, it, the, they're also sort of like, they're like, well, when you're alone, you're not actually like, Mm -hmm. and your your thoughts and your heart are not holy like when mm -hmm. when you're out in public you sort of say and do the right things but, mm -hmm. but when you're alone you're not connecting with the whole yeah okay but I, I want to bring us our attention back to this clause so you're right god's sad right it, this is a personal implication Part, heschel's point is that god's prophecy like god's communication via prophecy is not just castigating people, stop doing bad stuff, which I think is a lot of like kind of the moral rhetoric nowadays, but it is grounded in the person. It is personal to God because this isn't just the people acting badly. This is the people betraying their relationship to God. And what I want us to pay attention to, again, the prophet is a skilled user of poetic language. Third person general, distant, abstract. Second person, direct address, direct a critique. First person subject, God brings God's self into the discussion as personally involved, but that's different than implicated. 
What's different about the first person here? It's the he, it's the subject rather than the um, rather than I. It's the third person, me. You it's are the first person object. The first, it's the first person. person object. Right, right. Rather than it saying I, Hebrew. it's me. Here it is in the Hebrew. Me e t gilisa. You have a gilisa, like the word gullus, like the word galui, right? Exposed. You have exiled yourself. You, have, I mean, abandoned is the right word. Perfect translation, JPS. You have abandoned me. S is an impossible word to translate in English because we don't have it. What does S mean? Et. Et means, doesn't mean anything. It is the objective marker. O-T. O-T-H-A. O-T-A. O-T-O. Right? E-T. May E-T. You have abandoned me. So here, God is not just involving God's self because God cares. God is personally implicated by this, not through God's choice, Kivyachal, but because it impacts God. God as object. God showing the people what you do matters to me because what you do hurts me. You abandoned me. God is in pain. It's a subtle little thing that you could miss. But again, the ramping up of intensity, the ramping up of personalization from third person to second person to first person involvement to first person implication. You can't get more personal than that. Intimate than that. God is trying to get the people to realize you are living your lives as if what you do doesn't matter. But it's hurting me. But that's not the end of it, because if, if, if it was just God saying, wah, 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 you're hurting me, then actually in a way, God, God would be just like them. Because the ambit of God's concern would actually just be about God's self. But we're going to see that when God says, you're hurting me, it's also at the same time modeling a moral position that God is demanding or evoking or, con you know, uh, God is trying to uh, draw persuade the people into occupying. Okay. Whom do you dread and fear that you tell lies? Right? Who are you responsible to? To Susie's point, right? Nobody. You gave no thought to me, first person object, you paid no heed. Right? You don't think, you're not thinking about me. This is like a betrayed spouse. Right? Who, who are you responsible to here, says God. Not me, apparently. You're not giving two wits about me. And here, in, and this is a fascinating, you don't usually see God say this, but it's a fascinating thing. God says then, God not just now implicates God's self in terms of its impact. You've abandoned me. You're not thinking about me. God now implicates God's self in terms of responsibility. God says, I have stood idly by so long that you have no fear of me. God says, I've been, I've been negligent. I've been distant. God doesn't ultimately say, I, I approve of that. It's, it's all my fault. You are, they are still responsible for their actions. But God says, again, grounding it in the fact that this is about a relationship. God says, I have been distant and you have filled the space with yourselves. For thus said he who high aloft forever dwells. Ki choamar ram venisa shaychen ad vekadai shemai. Now, what language is that? Have we seen that kind of language before? Who else is described as being high and aloft? Well, the first prophet was describing all the leaders that they good abandon the people they don't care good you know? good susie exactly the people are critiqued for being lofty for being removed and now here comes god saying hey you're not thinking about me anymore 
B. But to be fair, I, I, I have been distant. I've been, I've been removed. C. Here says Isaiah, right? We should switch voices. Thus says he, right? He, Isaiah switched back to the third, the descriptive voice, not like citing God, but now talking about God. Here's what Shoichenan Maram Vikadai Shemai says. Here's the one who dwells, high removed, transcendent aloft. Wait, what? <laughs> Isn't that bad? Aren't we saying that it's bad to be removed in a loft? Why is God being described as exactly the things you're criticizing the people for, be, for doing? Exactly the position that you're saying is leads to apathy, leads to remove, leads to negligence. You're saying God now is also up on God's hill, chilling on God's ivory couches? But here comes the twist. I dwell on high in holiness, yet twist yet with the contrite and the lowly in spirit reviving the spirits of the lowly reviving the hearts of the contrite the word vi well the the participle vi part of part of simple no whatever it is the radical vi means and but it also can mean but fascinatingly in hebrew the word for and which is a conjunction is the same word as disjunction but this word works as but from our perspective. Oh, the God who is up high, removed, holy, powerful, right? Full of might. Of course, then that God would be removed, would be concerned with, you know, going to the races, going riding in, in, their, in their country estate, right? Watching their investments grow, cackling over their wealth. Of course, that's what the rich and powerful do. But, wait a second, God cares about the sick? God cares about the lowly? What? Mind-blowing from a human perspective. That's but. I would argue, though, it's and from God's perspective. Because in God's eye, it's not a surprise. Because that is what it means to be God. That is what it means to have power. Is to utilize, expend that power for the sake of those without. For the sake of those in need. Okay, so I dwell on a high, yet I also dwell with the contrite and the lowly in spirit. I revive the spirits of those who are depressed, those who are oppressed, and I revive the hearts. Of, contrite is the wrong word. Nidka means oppressed. It doesn't mean sorry. It means here like, a, you know, impacted, in pain. I want to look at, forgive me for being a little bit, outside of the prophets. I can't stop myself. But I want to look at a few fortune. I want to look actually the way that this narrative is going to intensify. Rashi on that line says, with the Marum V'Kadosh, with the lofty and holy, I dwell, with the lofty and holy ones I dwell. Right? The important thing about Rashi actually is that sometimes the ways he cites what's called a, a Davar Amaschil, like the Lectio, what's it called, the Lectio Prima, like the, 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 um, the words that introduce the comment. Sometimes it's like colon, my comment, and sometimes he actually flows right into it as a paraphrase. So with the lofty and holy ones I dwell, says God, right? In other words, it's not I dwell above and removed, but rather God actually is will, living with the angels. And thence... I am, thence, I am with the crushed and humble in spirit upon whom I lower my presence. So Rashi, in a sense, just sees this as two things next to each other. I live within the supernal heights. I live in the angelic realms. And then I am with the crushed and the humble. To God, it's not a contradiction. I'm one place, I'm another place. In a, I mean, I think in a way it's subtle. It's saying it's the same to me. Right? I'm not identified with living in one place than another. God has two residences. God is living in with the angels, and God lives with, with the lowly humans. You know where God doesn't live, interestingly? Where, where doesn't it say God lives? With the, <clears throat> with the rich up on the hill. On the hill, exactly. Where is God's height dwelling? God's heightly dwelling, lofty dwelling, is not on the hill with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, with the richy riches, with the hoity-toity. God's lofty dwelling is with the angels. So if God wants to be lofty, God's in the angel. God's with the angels. But when God is concerned with human beings, I mean, in God's aspect of being concerned with human beings, 
God is not with the hoity-toity. God is with the hoi polloi. God is with the real people, the people in need, the people whom the rich are supposed to be concerned. Okay, here's Matsudas David, who, the commentary that's only on Navi. It's not on, it's not on Torah at all. So we'll see it a little bit more as we continue in this class. Um, so, Koamar, right, thus says the one Marum Bakadosh. God is situated above, and why does he say that? Actually, interestingly, he's going to do a little twist here. He says, meaning that God is good to and cares for all. God attends to all. So why is God actually described as being removed? What is, another, what is that another way of saying? God is what? Everywhere. Yeah, God is impartial. God is concerned with all without exception. Right? Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere. Right? God is above, i.e. God is working on a different plane. God is not on the hill looking down on people. Rather, God is not on earth. Because to God, all people are of equal value, no matter your position. And fascinating, he actually uses a word that almost did away with my entire class, but we're going to work against it. It says, thus does it say that God is lofty and most high, dwelling eternal, because God cannot be moved to Nua. God cannot be described, cannot be uh, um, ascribed movement. So like, oh no, wait, is he saying the philosophers are right? Oh no, is he saying that God is the unmoved? But what he means is that God doesn't have bias. God can't like receive payment under the table. God doesn't take your libations and your sacrifices to look the other way. God can't be paid off. That's what it means by moved here. It does not mean personally implicated. God is transcendent, marom, again, a word that can mean removed, distant. That is, insofar as scripture says, I dwell in a holy place, even so, yet, twist, I am with the broken and low of spirit, attending to and reviving the spirit of those oppressed. So he's in the disjunction space. He's in the, you might think, it's a havamina. You might think that I'm, since God is described as being most high, I, I would be removed from the concerns of the, of the normal people. Wrong. Wrongo. And here comes Ibn Ezra, our most, one of our most linguistically attentive Mephorshim. Um, late 12th, early, wait late 11th, early 12th century, mid-12th 12, mid, mid 12th century um, Spanish commentator, um, wrote, really cared about grammar. Here's what he says. This is fascinating. I dwell in the high and holy place with the angels, so he agrees with Rashi, and with, and with the lowly and, con, and the oppressed, I dwell on earth, I dwell to revive the spirit, etc., or... I dwell in the high and holy place above with the angels in order to give life to those humble on earth. That is a very subtle inversion. Mm. Mitsudas David is in the yet space. Oh, God's up high, but don't think that God is removed. Still, God cares. Ibn Ezra says, it's not just that God is above and yet is on earth. But rather, God is only above, so that God can be concerned with the earth. God, in a sense, seems to be like drawing on the power of the angels, using the angel. Like God is on heaven, in heaven, only because that's the best place for God to be, to be concerned, to be actively involved with human affairs. To be in heaven is not to be, in a way, when it says above, super, like lofty, it's not talking about position. It's talking about positioning. God is, has, can see all of earth this way. God can be drawing on God, all of God's faculties to be involved, right? To be hashkacha, to have hashkacha, right? To be attending to, involved with human affairs. The prophet refuses. I mean, really, the prophet as mouthpiece of God refuses an image of God as one that is sanctioned, transcendent, alone. God is making it God's business to be involved with the affairs of people because God cares. 
That's the definition. I mean, I would say Ibn Ezra is saying that's the definition of God. God's in heaven. Heaven exists for earth. So God is in this relationship. God responds with passion because God feels this personally. God is rejected, feels the sting of rejection, and thus reacts. God, care, God reacts with wrath because what people are doing matters, and thus God responds with intensity. Um, God wants... This is like a quick citation from from this prop from this prophecy from Yesha, from Yirmiyahu, right? So we saw before that we saw that the people were trying to use religion in a sense to get their way with God. Oh, I'm going to give God a little like I'm going to give God, God some offerings. I'm going to give God some libations and see if God goes my way. Yirmiyahu says very explicitly quotes God saying explicitly. Thus said God, add your burnt offerings to your other sacrifices and eat the meat. I don't care. The sacrifice is for you, not for me, says God. When I freed your fathers from the land of Egypt, I did not speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice. Let's bracket for a sec second the fact that one of God's first commandments was the sacrifice at the, like the, the Paschal Lamb. That was exceptional. The point of that was to save the people. That wasn't like, that wasn't sacrifices. What was their relationship like? So, I mean, what's God doing in saying this? What, well, first of all, what contrast is God trying to make? Maybe let's start with a different question. Why is it that, that I, uh, Yirmiyahu is quoting God, bringing our memory back to Egypt? Why? What does it bring to mind for you? Well, it was mm -hmm. like God's greatest act of caring for his creation, his people. Okay, great. Perfect example of God involved in history. Right, God involved with human affairs. Very good. Okay, so that is the site of contact between the people and God. After, going back to the previous passage we saw, a time of absence. All right, God was removed. And then it took the people crying out for that relationship to be reignited again. So good, very good. I, but also let's think about the position, right? The, the moment in their timeline. Egypt is the initiation of a relationship between the people and God. All right, before in Brashit, it was the patriarchs and God, Abraham and Abraham's God, Isaac and Isaac's God, Jacob and Jacob's God, right? But only with, with Shmos, right, with Exodus, with the book, of, with the Exodus from Egypt, do we have the first um, concretization of relationship of God with the people, okay? So in a way, this is their meet cute. This is the beginning, this is their honeymoon. This is the beginning of their relationship. And God says, remember the beginning of our relationship? Was I talking about sacrifices then? No. This is what I commanded them. Do my bidding that I might be your God and you may be my people. Walk only in the way that I enjoin upon you that it may go well with you. What's the kernel of the divine of the relationship between the Jewish people and God, says God. What isn't it? It's not religion. What were sacrifices in the ancient world? Davening, right? That's how they davened. That's how they, that's how they did their mitzvahs, right? They did sacrifices. That's what they did, right? That was the, the cult, right? The right of Israel. It's the ritual of Israel. Not about ritual, says God. What is it really about? Like, there's a reason the reform, like, love the prophets, right? What is it really about, says, says Yirmiyahu, says God? It's about uh, Menschlichkeit, basically. About following in the ways of treating, being like God. I mean, we're made in the image of God, meaning that we also feel for other, should be feeling for other people 
looking after the sick, etc. Um, that's the way of Hashem. I, I do agree with you, but interestingly here, even though I agree with you, ultimately you're not wrong in that there are moral implications, but just in the text, it's, it's surprisingly amoral. This is what I command them. Do my bidding that I might be your God and you may be my people. Walk only in the way that I enjoin upon you that it may go well with you. I mean, let's translate in that regular English. This is what I commanded them. Listen to me so I can be your God and you will be my people. Walk only in the way that I instruct you to, i.e., listen to me, so that things will go well. What's the kernel of the relationship, says God? It's contentless. So what is it? Remember, the point of this class is, is not really about the content, it's about what's behind the content. God is saying, there is no content. What is it, really? It's the relationship. That's it. It's the encounter. It's the connection. It's listening. What is God asking everyone to be? A prophet. Because what is the prophet except the one who listens to God, who pays attention? A prophet is a contentless relationship because what defines it, that's what Heschel's getting at, what defines it is concern, attention, passion, care. But those are all frameworks for content. The words of the prophecies matter because of the relationship. It's compelling because it matters to the one who's involved. You and God. And the thing that God keeps on trying to get us to remember is, I care about you. Why'd you stop caring about me? And it's because you started caring about yourselves that then, as Lauren's point, quite rightly, you slipped into immorality. And if you were caring about me, and if you stayed attentive in this relationship, it would lead you to modeling yourselves after me, being compassionate, caring, you know, dwelling with the lowly and the sick. I think something the contemporary Jewish community needs to remember. Oh, Yiddishkeit matters, Judaism matters, do your Torah and mitzvahs. Yeah, fine, but like, is it going to change your life? Is it going to command you to put it on the line? The key to the experience, I'm sorry, the key to this is not Judaism, but God. But that particular sentence, at least, like without all the context of what you just said, is a really uncomfortable sentence. Like that's like, you must blindly follow me. Like I'm your leader and you gotta follow me. And like- Well, I mean, like, let's not be, you know, like, let's not trick ourselves here. Like, only one of us is God in this relationship. <laughs> um, and I think it does mean trust, in a sense. It's not unilateral in the sense that uh, what defines a covenant is that we owe God stuff and God owes us stuff too. But you're right. You're right. It could be interpreted in line of obedience. I'm more interpreting it in line with attention. Shimu Bikoli, listen to me when I talk to you. I really do think, like, if you bring it to, like, let's say moments of disconnection in a human relationship, right? It's because people have stopped attending to each other, paying attention to each other, listening to each other. God is saying you stopped listening. And when you stop listening, I'm not, your, I'm not God anymore. I'm not your God. I'm only your God if you listen. So yeah, on one hand, it's like, yeah, like we are, we, we obey God. On the other hand, though, if we don't, then like God's done. So we like, we do have an interesting amount of influence in this relationship too. Okay. So God is trying to 
bring our attention back to the experiential core that is key, central to what it means to be in the Jewish people, to be, but really to the point, in a relationship with God, that it's a relationship with God, and that they perverted the religion, the Judaism, to be a, an impersonal, manipulatable system, right? You're going to pay me off of sacrifices. I'm going to do the frum thing. I'm going to learn like a blot of Gemurah. I'm going to daven, right? But it means nothing if you're just doing it to get in good, if you're just doing it to satisfy yourself, if you're just doing it to be pious, to be frum. The point is that, and here Lauren was right on the money, the point is not to do the thing. The point is to listen to me. The point is to pay attention, to be in that alive relationship. I really do think in a way, Yirmiyahu is saying, well, God is saying, everyone needs to be like Yirmiyahu, listening. I'm talking, says God. The question is, are you listening? To Heschel's point, to the prophet, God does not reveal himself in an abstract absoluteness. Right? God is not principle, but in a personal and intimate relation to the world. He does not simply command and expect obedience. Right? Like Heschel agrees with you, Susie, like you could take it that way. But Heschel's pushing it further and saying, he is also moved and affected by what happens in the world. God's implication, I think, is what undermines this from just being a power trip and reacts accordingly. Yes, God wants us to be attentive, to be engaged. But also, God is attentive and engaged because God is wrecked constantly by our mistakes by our straying. Events and human actions arouse in him joy or sorrow, pleasure or wrath. I, I want to say, by the way, I think I mentioned this before, but this is Heschel's fifth language. <laughs> I, I wish I could write like this in my first language. It's just astounding. This notion that God can be intimately affected, that he possesses not merely intelligence and will, but also pathos. This idea that God is affected by what happens on the wor in the world. That God is not just a mind and command, but is also feeling, care, concern. That defines the prophetic consciousness of God, of being aware of that. That's what defines it. He not only rules the world in the majesty of his might and wisdom, but reacts intimately to the acts of history. He does not judge men's deeds impassively and with aloofness. His judgment is imbued with the attitude of one to whom those actions are of the most intimate and profound concern. God responds to us not just because God is finding a way to cancel us or to critique us or to call us out, call us in, God is reaching out to us because God is affected by us. God does not stand outside the range of human suffering and sorrow. Maro, the Kadosh. God is personally involved in, even stirred by, the conduct and fate of man. Now, again, I want to. So, what we have here is we started with the 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 um the antagonist the cr the object of critique the the apathetic the no pathos the removed the egotistical the lustful those who are the ambit of their concern extends to the end of themselves and god brings the contrast saying i mean first tries to con dislodge us from that apathy by saying Look, what you do matters. It hurts me. It, you've abandoned me. I'm in pain here. The point of God saying I'm in pain, though, isn't so God, because God is selfish, too. 
God's also not self-oriented, but rather because God is trying to teach us that what we do affects others. And by God bringing God's own impact, it is a model to show that what we do has significance and that we have responsibility for the choices that we make because they hurt people. They hurt God even. And if it hurts God, call the Chomer, of course, it hurts people too. God is, you know, in heaven. God has everything. God is fine, ultimately, but not because God is upset. But think about people who don't have that, who don't have a panoply of angels to help, like, to help them, right? If, if God is hurt, then call the Chomer, other people are hurt as well. So God bringing God's concern does have moral implications. And that's what we're going to end the class by looking at this passage here. Um, so God, this is also from Jeremiah. All right, we have images of pathos that we, we don't have time to get to right now, but there's images and images and images of people who are impacted. Famous image of, of Rachel, Rachel, weeping for her children. Contrast, contrast, contrast. You could be up on the hill drinking your tea, or you could be passionately and intimately concerned with those to whom you're connected, weeping over your children. She refuses to be comforted for her children who are gone. Her persistence, she doesn't take the libations. Rachel ends up being a model for God. God could buy out. And it is with feeling that God responds when you come to God with feeling. They shall come with weeping. And when they come with weeping, when their hearts turn, God doesn't bring the hammer down, but I will lead them with compassion. God of pathos, the point of the God of wrath, is to jar us from our apathy, to help us realize that what we do hurts people. And then when we realize that, when we can be empathetic to that, in my naivete, I genuinely do believe, I really do actually believe this, that if people knew, if people could feel what it felt like to hurt somebody, no one ever would. That might be my naivete, I don't know. But God is saying, I'm bringing my pain to you as an education to show you that what you do hurts. And once you realize that, you will turn, tshuva. And once you turn, I will resp that the wrath is only to shake us, to move us out of our place of, of stupor, our moral stupidity, and to move us to a place of moral concern such that when we turn and we come with regret, with crying, with tshuva, God responds not with wrath now, but with love, with compassion. With love, I will receive them and guide them. There is hope for your future. God comes with hope now. And this is where I want to move us towards, is that there's a resilience. God brought our attention back to the kind of the, the originary moments of our relationship at Egypt. And it's those images of the beginning that God uses not as, think, as evidence of what we've lost, but rather as a persistence of what still is. It's called Havas Nu'uraim, the love of one's youth. Look at how God, God describes God's self. And this is incredible. This is, this is what God imagines through the prophet's mouth to people to say, receive me back, let me return. Right, so we hear again, let's pay attention to the language. This is what's called the vocative case, right? Let me, it's the, or is even the jussive. Like it's suggesting, it's, it's yearning, it's asking. Right? Let me return. For you, O Lord, or my God. Remember, you listen. If you're not listening, I'm not your God. So here we have the reconnection of the relationship. It's the relationship that makes God God. <laughs> now that I have turned back, I am filled with remorse, okay? Here's what God responds. Interestingly, it switches. It's not clear that actually we're switching from the Israelite voice to the God voice. It says, now that I am made aware, right, says Israel, I strike my thigh, I beat my chest, I'm ashamed, I have regret. 
I'm disgraced. I bear the disgrace of my youth, says Israel. And what's the implication there? That what I've done has stained me. Youthful mistakes, the errors of one's youth, right? The sins of youth. And the claim implied is that doing things wrong means that you are, because your origin is tainted, so are you. A disgrace of my youth, says Israel. And here's what God says. Remember, Ephraim is a metonymy. It refers to the people. So here's what God says. Truly, Ephraim is a dear son to me, a child that is dandled. Who, how does God see the people? Right, God's looking at God's rebellious teenage child. Crash the car got caught bullying his classmates and realizes what they've done comes with regret crying and god as parent who does god see a baby now i think i imagine this is an experience that parents can understand. I have to imagine it, but that people's ages are suggestions in a way. When you see your child, you don't see just them as they happen to be. You see the purity of that connection that can never be lost, that the goodness that is inherent in them, which can never be taken away. Look at the images. Remember, who's, I mean, who's, who's the biblical figure we drew on before as a model? Rachel as mother crying over her children. Ephraim is a dear son to me, a child that is dandled. Uh-huh, that is, no, a child I have dandled. What imagery is God, is God using? God as mother. Whenever I have turned against him, against my child, my thoughts would dwell on him still. This love can't be taken away even though our relationship sometimes has been strained, I am still passionately concerned with my child. I love my child. That is why my heart yearns for him. I will receive him back in love, declares the Lord. It is not a question whether we will be received. It is guaranteed. The only thing keeping us from that love is ourselves. <laughs> So what is the, um, what's the conclusion? What's God trying to get us to do? Build homes and live in them. That's what God tells the exiles to do. Build homes and live in them. In other words, where aren't you supposed to be anymore? What does it mean to receive the love that God is giving you in, inhabit that love and now start to practice the love. Yeah, mom? So you're not supposed to be wandering anymore to establish community? Good, good. You're not peripatetic. You're not wandering around. You are grounding yourself in community. You're not on a, on a couch, on a palanquin, in a palanquin on a hill. Right? You're not, and I think about the, the, the tent on the hill. You move a tent. The home you're building. Quite, what? quite right, Mom. You're investing in where you are. You're not building fortresses up on a hill. You're building homes. Plant gardens. Eat their fruit. Now, I think the thrust of this imagery is actually that, like, you will have security in the future, says God. But I actually think there's a little bit in the background here. That's not just you all have security in terms of what you enjoy. That's hill style, right? That's up on the hill type people. You're planting gardens. Gardens yield produce. Gardens pay back. You're investing in where you live. Get married. Have kids. Get your kids married. Invest in the generations. Invest in the future. Seek the wealth. And here's the, here's the, I think here's, here I think I have evidence. Like it's not just me counter reading this. Seek the welfare of the city to which I have exiled you and pray to God in, in its behalf. Don't give me sacrifices anymore to get on my good side. Don't daven for yourself. What does it really mean? 
It's moving your concern from yourself to others. Who else is concerned with others? God, right? So we have God trying to shake us out of our egotistical stupor by saying, I care about you. What you do matters to me. And that models what it means for you to receive that attention, to inhabit it, to embody it, to internalize it. Just as God is not primarily, cons like, feels personally impacted, but is not concerned about God's self, God is concerned about you. So you too need to realize, oh, I'm implicated in society. Oh, this world is affecting me, and I need to be concerned with others. I need to motivate that concern and invest it in the well-being of others. Invest in the well, seek the welfare of the city. It's not your welfare, it is the welfare of others, the people amongst whom you live. I am mindful of the plans I have made concerning you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a hopeful future. Prophecy is a futural event. Prophecy is about us taking responsibility for what the future entails. God trying to have us realize that we are responsible. We are implicated in what is coming. We are, it's, we are not just able to satisfy ourselves. We are responsible. We are commanded to seek the welfare of others. For God, and here's the point, for God to reach out at all is because God cares and God believes in us. Yes, God is saying, listen to me, believe in me. And it would be unilateral and obedient if the point of actually every prophecy, it's not just the content, what's behind the content, if the point of every prophecy is God saying that God believes in us. God has faith in us that we can change, that we can do better, that we can grow. Every prophecy is not just like we say, oh, prophecy is about a future, like it's predicting something. No. Prophecy is about investing in the future. It's about making a future. Not discovering it or deciphering it. It's about, in, it's about investing in it. Building the homes and living in the homes. Build the homes and live in the home of the future. Build the future you want to live in. When you call me, says God, and come pray to me, I will give heed to you. If you reignite this relationship, that activates it. You will search for me and find me. But what's the only condition? If only you seek me wholeheartedly. Bechol levavchem. That's where I want to leave us. What does God really want from us? It's not obedience. It's not frumkeit. It's to really feel. God reacts with passion because God is affected by what we do in this world. And God is asking us to be like that too. To live with our whole hearts. To live with our whole hearts and to bring that heart to God. That's what God really wants. Not libations and offerings, but us fully, authentically, us. And if we do that, we can come with our, if we learn how to feel again, if we learn how to reignite our own pathos, to be concerned with others, to be impacted, to be affected, to be vulnerable, to be sensitive, right? To feel what's going on around us and to feel connected to it then God will be not just around, God will be there. God will be at hand. I will be found.
I think that's 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 where that's a good place to stop. So uh, I'm very dark now. Um, so we moved from as the trajectory of this class, we moved from a place of unfeeling, of selfishness, of apathy. And God's bringing God's own care and passion, even reacting strongly, not to hurt, but to move us, to show how much it matters. Because if God did not react so intensely, we could do away with it. But God reacts intently to show us how much what we do matters. And then we learn from that how to take responsibility for ourselves, how to remember that what we do means something, what we do affects others, to feel how it affects others, just as God feels how it affects God, and to take upon ourselves what it means to live like that, to live with our whole hearts, exposed, open, invested, and connected. Thank you so much for joining. Um, there was some discovering some really special stuff. Um, I hope if you have a chance to uh, check out one of I mean one of Heschel's many masterworks, The Prophets, uh, really worth trying to find. Um, pretty, it's 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 reprinted in a paperback, so it's pretty it's in print. Um, Thank you all for joining. Um, we're, we're not going to have parts of chat on Thursday because I have a rabbi test on Sunday, so I am uh, studying, studying, studying for that. Uh, but we will have Cabal Shabbos on Friday. We, uh, weather dependent, might meet again on Saturday. Right now the forecast is rain, but it might change. And uh, we will have Havdalah, might say Shabbos, uh, where you can all wish me luck. So um, thanks so much for joining. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful rest of your week. And uh, take care. Thank you. At Mahatslacha on the exam.